Hey guys, this is Elise. Today's conversation on COVID-19 mental health chats is going to be part of a series on the basic tasks of grief. This video is made for everyone. In today's chat, I'm going to identify 11 types of complicated grief. Then I will identify what type of grief our culture may be having and give simple tasks on what to do if you resonate with the grief types described in this video. The content reflects some things I learned in a training for treating grief from Cornerstone of Hope and is adapted from writings of Rando, Warden, and Doka. I've used it in therapy with my patients and clients of all backgrounds with all different issues. The 11 types of grief are abbreviated grief, absent grief, chronic grief, conflicted grief, delayed grief, disenfranchised grief, distorted grief, exaggerated grief, inhibited grief, masked grief, and unanticipated, un, if I can say this, unanticipated grief. I'll start by giving short explanations for each type of grief and then identify what types are present in our culture at large. Individually, of course, you may be experiencing additional or less types of grief than our culture because you are each having your own experience of what's going on, which is entirely and completely real. So, abbreviated grief is typically short-lived and a normal form of grief. It's often mistaken to be unresolved grief. It's a shortened process because the lost person or thing is immediately replaced. Absent grief is characterized by emotional numbness, maladaptive behavior is also common, but often the one grieving is unable to connect the maladaptive behaviors with their experience of loss. It's very rare for the mourner to maintain complete denial of the loss. Chronic grief is demonstrated by little or no progress, and the mourning process fails to come to any conclusion. The bereaved tries to keep the losses alive. Conflicted grief is often characterized by extreme anger and guilt. Exaggerated anxiety is manifested in panic attacks, and that can be common. The conflicted pattern can become quite prolonged with a need to remain connected to the loss. Delayed grief may result from pressing responsibilities the mourner needs to attend to, resulting in postponed grief that may last for years. The thing with delayed grief is when there is a real loss, you will grieve now or later and you'll never outrun it. Disenfranchised grief is when the mourner feels or realistically is situated where they cannot openly acknowledge, publicly mourn in a socially supported way. This is commonly found with survivors of abuse, the loss of a childhood friend, losing a child in stillbirth, infertility, transitions, and a sense of lost experiences due to gender or sexual identity confusions. Distorted grief is often exhibited as extreme anger or extreme guilt, often at risk for depression and suicide, which can be recognized as overreactivity without a sense of loss, psychosomatic illness, formal appearance with schizophrenic affects, agitated depression, and self-destructive patterns socially and economically. Exaggerated grief is a chronic reaction that often leads to a clinical depression and may be accompanied by nightmares, outbursts of fear and anger, strong guilt prompting the conviction of a necessity to self-punish and make amends by dying. This may lead to suicide. Inhibited grief is seen in those who do not allow themselves to experience the pain of grief directly and may develop somatic complaints or illnesses. They may intensely idealize the subject of loss with little review, acceptance, or relinquishment of the negative aspects of their relationship with the one or the thing lost. Masked grief may manifest as a result afterwards or like a Venn diagram overlapped. Masked grief is unrecognized grief reactions that exhibit through physical symptoms or maladaptive behavior. They may have similar be um, symptoms or behavior suffered by the deceased, but those symptoms may be factitious. Unanticipated grief entails great difficulty in accepting the loss that is accompanied by overwhelming feelings as a reaction to untimely, unanticipated losses. It is defined by persistence of physical and emotional shock, 
obsessive construction of events in retrospect, intense emotional reactions, and overlap of post-traumatic symptoms. They may become unable to function normally in any area of their life. Although the mourner can intellectually recognize the death or the loss, they will often have great difficulty in accepting the loss due to it being so sudden and so unexpected. So, hearing all of these brief descriptions of the 11 types of grief, you may have picked up on um, our culture at large may likely be demonstrating pockets of absent grief for those who are having a difficult time acting in compliance with physicians' strong suggestions to stay home, demonstrating a type of grief that is in response to the loss of perceived personal freedoms. That's just an example. Um, you may also recognize that our culture may be experiencing conflicted grief, delayed grief, and unanticipated grief among our frontline workers and volunteers, our first responders, our healthcare workers. The other types of griefs may apply to individuals based on their own personal histories, if they have a history of other mental emotional disorders, whether or not they were formally assessed diagnostically. Granted, I am giving a very, very brief and fast <laughs> encapsulation of information. So if you want a true diagnostic assessment, please consult with a professional. Now, we could talk at much length about what to do to treat grief in detail and move forward towards a higher state of functioning, but I can make it very simple for you. Thankfully, um, Warden created the TIER model of grief, which has four main tasks. T stands for to accept the reality of the loss. E stands for experience the pain of the loss. A is for adjust to the new environment without the lost subject or object. R is for reinvest in the new reality. So that leads to the follow-up question. How can I, as an individual, identify what the loss is for me? So again, without working with you individually, I can't tell you for sure what your loss in these times may be. However, I can give some examples and maybe one of them will resonate with you. Common losses, according to more than the 2,000 comments, messages, and emails that I've received from different individuals on the front lines, as well as those not on the front lines, are some of the following. The loss of a personal sense of freedom, the loss of having the ability to normally go through rituals of mourning family members or community members who have died in this time period. The loss of having the ability to normally go through rituals of helping patients as a healthcare worker die in the presence of loved ones, the loss of a sense of having total control over one's world, the loss of a sense of having total control over one's dependents, such as children and what their childhood before becoming an adult should look like. Those are just a few examples that are common themes and patterns that many others are experiencing in this time. So. The unfortunate but nevertheless true beauty of going through a shared traumatic situation is that you can on a practical level come to terms with the loss you are experiencing with others around you who are also experiencing them. Chances are, I'll just make a couple examples, if you're a high schooler who can't go to prom or senior skip day, you can talk about that loss with other high school friends. Chances are, for another example, if you're a healthcare worker who had to hold someone's hand as they passed without family or friends, you can debrief the emotional experience with colleagues on your unit who also witnessed and experienced the inability of accessing physically visitors for your patients. And these people will inherently understand what the normal rituals and procedures and protocols are to help patients pass during times of peace. These are just a couple examples. To do letter E on that tier model by Warden, you can share the experience of the pain of the loss with a core circle of supportive people. That might be your mom, your dad, your partner, or your best friend. It could be your faith leader or a mentor who shares your worldview. It could be your coworker or your really awesome boss or your previous boss who was really awesome. Keep that core circle tight. 
and reach out to say, hey, can I talk with you about what I'm experiencing? And if you're able, you can also say, I'm also willing to listen to what you're feeling and thinking too. If they're open to it, great. If they aren't, and maybe they're just not able to in this time, they're trying to figure out how to navigate and self-regulate, that's okay. Identify another person who you could trust. To do letter A on the tier model, which is the second one, talk with your core circle about what the experience is and what feels like small adjustments that can be made to help you keep moving forward and playing your part and your role in all of this in the big picture. Maybe your core people have suggestions for you, or maybe there aren't any suggestions about things to do in this very moment or about some very detailed part of your life. But you can maintain the relationship with that person and those people to keep coming back and keep having openness of communication in safety and privacy with your core people. To do letter R, do the action plan from letter A, and then step forward and stick to it. Keep your eyes open and your ears open for behaviors you see others doing that seem to be working or new ideas that you hear about. Lean your shoulder into the discomfort of becoming flexible to change. Well, that's it for now. These four tasks may help you self-care for a brief time. For some, it may be enough to move forward positively. For others, you may need additional professional support. For a directory of therapists who are wanting to help out in this time, check out the links below. I'll see you guys next time on COVID-19 Mental Health Chat.